Welcome back, lovely listener, vibrant viewer. Well, lucky me, I get to hang out with a self-made billionaire. He's sitting right next to me. This is his new book. John Cordwell, you've heard of him. Of course, you have. He went from bullied child to self-made billionaire. The new book is called Love, Pain and Money, The Making of a Billionaire. He tells his story and he'll tell us now how he overcame endless career misfortunes, terrible personal tragedies, and in the end, rose to the top. The phones for you found it has also been back in the headlines this week to switch off his heating just so he can stick it to Vladimir Putin and he's not one to shy away from sticking it to the government either. John Caldwell is here. Hello. Hi Vanessa, thanks for having me. <laughs> really good to have you here. Is it true? Are you really, you've got these wonderful mansions all over the place, are you really going to sit there freezing in your, in your jumper and woolly socks in there because you're cold? Well I'm not going to freeze because I'll heat one room but I will put more clothing on and the reason is very simple. I cannot I cannot preach to everybody, which I do do, mm. about not moaning about the cost of heating and having central heating that we never had in my day, you know, mm. going back 50, 60, 70 years. None of us had central heating. We sat in front of two lumps of coal. And my simple point is that every time we put the heating on, we are enabling Putin to gain dollars and to slaughter Ukrainian people, and that's not acceptable. So I'm leading by example, as I've done all the way through my business life, as you'll read in the book there. I lead by example, I lead from the front, and I'm leading from the front. I can afford all the heating I ever want, but I'm turning it off. My God. Mostly. Well, obviously, you know, people who are vulnerable, people who are ill, people who are elderly yeah. should definitely not copy you in this. No, and not absolutely. feel that it's a political crusade that they have to go on and freeze themselves to death uh, in their houses. God forbid. We don't want that. Do absolutely. We? And, and it's not meant to influence the poor and disabled people. It's meant to influence the people that are able bodied and that are young, fit, and healthy and turn the heating off and deprive Putin of those dollars that are causing mayhem in Europe. Let, let's give people some kind of hope. I mean, when you started off in life, if somebody had told you you're going to end up a billionaire, you're going to end up with these magnificent homes, you're going to end up with a succession of beautiful women on your arm, you're going to have a life of great glamour and excitement and variety, what would you have said to them then? <laughs> they were mad. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Tell me what your childhood was like. I mean, not easy. Well, I already touched on it, really. Yeah. Uh, we had a metal bath on the wall. Mm -hmm. I remember trying, as a five, six-year-old, trying to get that metal bath off the wall and it freezing to my fingers because it was covered in frost. And you put it in front of a fire, and I remember this quite vividly. We put it into, in front of a tiny little fire in front, in the kitchen, which was the only room we had a fire in, yeah. two lumps of coal on there, and I was so frozen because I had one kettle full of water that I leaned over to the fire to try and get some heat, fell in oh. and burnt all my arm. I had to go to the hospital. Yeah. The hospital was warm, though. It was nice. The hospital was warm. Oh, my God. Now, come on, it's all getting very extreme. Yeah, but it's, tr it's true, and, and that's and the way we used to live in those days. So was that the motivation for making money? Was indeed making money ever your actual motivation, or was it a side effect of what you did? Um, it wasn't the motivation for making money. You know, I always I had this dream when I was young that um, I would be rich and successful and that I'd be philanthropic. And it became an absolute passion that I fulfilled that dream. I visualised it when I was seven in a dream and felt I had to fulfil it somehow. Had no idea how, but just fought like fury my whole life to make that dream come true. Mm -hmm. And it did do. I sold the business in 2006 and since then... Most of my life has been spent on charitable work. I know, but to get to the lives. bit where you get to make all that money, because I reckon that's the bit the billionaires and magnets always gloss over. They always get to the bit where they're, you know, they're sweeping the garage yard <laughs> and all of that kind of thing, and they're having to line their shoes with, with newspaper because they're so poor. And then you suddenly get to the bit where they've sold the business for X number of billions and millions and all of that. How do you get to that, that bit from the first bit? Well, sheer hard work, right. focus, dedication, long hours. Working out and... what, being what, doing what? <laughs> Building a business. Building a business is very multifaceted, especially when you start from nothing as a one single person, just one person driving forward. And you have to be smart, hardworking, resilient. You have to be able to put up with the massive pressures that come your way and fight through. And are we talking through. about phones for you? Is that what we're talking about? That you're well, working towards many, that? Or you did lots of other jobs first? And many businesses I had. Many uh, businesses. Yeah, many businesses. I had difficulties with all of them. They were all challenging. And one or two, uh, they, they failed because my suppliers cut off my supply, like Bellstaff Motorcycle Clothing. Uh -huh. Now, when I say failed, I never left any debts behind me ever. 
I always paid my debts off with my job at Michelin Tire Company. Right. But it was a struggle, you know, it was a huge battle. But I knew what I'd got to achieve and I was determined to achieve And what it. had you got to achieve? Just kind of almost limitless money so that you could no, do not, limitless good or what? No, not quite. No, that'd be too grandiose. What did you I wanted initially financial security in case my health packed up and I wanted to leave my family in a secure position, which was not the position that uh, we were in when I was a kid. Mm. My father died young and um, my mother had to slog herself very, very hard to survive. I never wanted that for my family, so I wanted to make sure that I made enough money for financial security. But the more success you have, the more you can see the formula, the more you can see how you can do it, and you just keep going this and going and going. Now, this is interesting, what you've just said. The more success you have, you said, the more you can see the formula. Yeah. Does that mean there is a magic formula for success no. that billionaires can see and nobody else can see? No, there isn't a magic formula. So what do you mean the more you can see the formula? Then? Well, because that's down to my specific circumstances and set of uh, goals and ambitions. I could see ways that I could grow the business constantly. I was constantly innovating. Give me an example new... of seeing a Oof. growth potential that somebody else might not have well, seen. Well, the, the, there's thousands, but what the one that really comes to mind is probably a little bit too complicated but I'll explain it to Go you. On. Um, we sold mobile phones to dealers yeah. and we sold the phone let's say for £600. The airtime uh, commission coming back from the networks might have been £400. Mm -hmm. the, the, the dealers had to wait for two months for that money and they couldn't afford the cash flow. So I came up with the idea of netting which meant I knocked the commission off up front and sold them the phone, let's say, for £250, but then I had to get the connection back. Now, that required really tight management because if they didn't give me a connection back, I lost all that okay. money. That opened up massive opportunities, massive risk, and massive so opportunities. So you became effectively a bank as well, kind of a lending bank, yeah. them the money in yeah, advance. Exactly. So, so having but made a great deal of money, you were facilitating the making of more money well, by I using the money as a as a kind of a money lender to, to kind yeah, of I hadn't grease made, and oil the wheels of the business to, to yeah. sell more phones. I hadn't made a great Clever. deal of money at that time. Clever, though. But I was able to do some of that. But there were a lot, there was thousands of measures I put in right. to, Lots of people to create listening wealth. Are going to wait for the bit where you say, and then I made all this money, all these millions or billions and just loads and loads of money. And you know what, Vanessa? Ah, it wasn't that great. Money isn't everything. I don't like it that much. You know, I would be perfectly happy with nothing living in a one room flat in Kilburn with a gas <laughs> ring and that'd be absolutely fine. You know, the bit where, where you say money doesn't make you happy or it doesn't yeah. feel the way you thought it would or that kind of a thing. Yeah. Are you are you thinking that? Do Is you that ever what think you that? want me to say? I wouldn't mind you saying it, but I've got a feeling that you don't feel that. No, I don't feel that. But what I absolutely am convinced of and no doubt whatsoever is that money doesn't make you happy. Mm -hmm. A lack of it can make you miserable, but money doesn't make you happy. So what does having lots of money do for you then? <laughs> well, in my case, it enables me to do lots of charity work and help a lot of people's lives. It gives me influence to try and make the world a better place. And that's one of my great objectives. And that really lifts me up spiritually all the time. And I fight for the underdog all the time, fight for causes, and I enjoy doing that, uh -huh. and it gives me the money to do it. But I can also entertain my friends, like I've just hired a small cruise ship and uh, taken 240 of my friends and family away. 240 of your closest on friends holiday. and family? Where yeah. have you taken yeah. them? Uh, Athens to Athens, all around the Greek Isles. Oh, and lovely. And, and so you feel it makes you feel nice and warm. Yeah, absolutely. And that kind of a yeah. thing. And, yeah. and, and I mean, you, you have a most elaborate home, and in fact, there have been magazine articles about it's practically, you know, gold plated and studded with rubies, isn't it? It's one of the most, well, what might you say, resplendent? You might say pretty showy. Have, it's definitely not understated, you but have I mean, got a huge amazing. ability to exaggerate. Well, what is it but, like? Can't, isn't there a river? Come on, there's a river <laughs> running through the dining well, room. Once again, over. once again, a massive. Of elaboration oh, and it exaggeration. Then, it's a tiny little stream Stop going through. It. Who has no, a tiny really little is. stream meandering through the dining well, room? When, when, you, you. when you come for dinner one night, when you invite me, I'll, I'll, put, I'll put a gondola on it and I'll float up and down. <laughs> but I mean, that is a that is a very elaborate home. It's the sort of it place is. that it most is. people it, not only couldn't afford, but a would never get to visit, and b I don't suppose would ever even envisage something no, like that—a no, a kind of small stream special. meandering through the dining room. Explain what that's about and what it looks like and how it feels living there and all of that. Well, it's it's a huge house. It, it's really beautifully done, very tasteful. The interior design was done in a magnificent way. Yeah. Uh, there is no gold. 
to your point. <laughs> We don't have gold-plated taps. We have a tree, a full tree. We do have yes. a tree with uh, blossom See, I read that article and, uh, carefully, didn't I? It was some yeah, time ago. Yeah. made a big impression. And uh, I was showing that today, actually, and it's a very, it's a very beautiful difference. Well, it's a dining people room. people come and visit you if you keep it cold in order to stick it to Putin? <laughs> well, that And helps. your river, your little river freezes over and they have to skate on it. Torval and Dean you'll have to invite over. That do helps. the bolero. What's that going to be like? <laughs> <laughs> Do I get to say a word on no, this? No, no. Of course not. Should I just listen to you? Yes, you know you love it. You should just listen to me. But I mean, people can, I think, when you're very, very wealthy and successful, be very, very deferential and take everything you say with immense seriousness. And actually, you can be quite serious, can't you? You can come over and interview. Oh, I'm, I'm often very, very serious. Very seriously. I've got, you know, I've got very serious views about a lot I of know, things. I know. That's why I was trying and to kind of see so... if we could find a cuddly underside somewhere <laughs> after all these years. Oh, you might a... laugh and you might smile. <laughs> there is a cuddly underside like somewhere, but it's hard to find. Tell me what's in that box anyway. Oh, well, this is Love, Pain and Money. Yeah. Which is on there. But I've yeah. also done especially for you, Luke, Cordopoly. Oh, look at that. So you can make your own fortune on the Cordwell. Gosh, I'm desperate board. to do that. That's exactly um, what I want to do, make my own fortune. We have customised Monopoly board oh, with my properties, my businesses, my charity, <laughs> all... Car centre, Michelin tyres, where I worked at Shop Man and Steel God. and so on. Personal All right, I'm going to ask you a, a serious question. I mean, the book is fascinating, obviously. It's an amazing story for some people, a fairy tale, you know, an amazing uh, tale. But but for people listening to this who are finding times very tough, which is practically everybody, um, and, and really finding it hard to get through the cost of living crisis, do you have any practical advice, anything you remember, anything you would do or not do to help people get through this? Well, it, it depends whether we're talking about business or private individuals, but... Now, one of the things that I think people have forgotten how to do... Oh, I don't think people can hear you well. I think your microphone's gone down, which is a shame. Is but if you say I'll repeat what you say, because my microphone's working. Oh, say it again. Now, yeah, what were you going to yeah. say? Uh, I, I think one of the issues is people really do need to try and cut the cloth according to He says to people need income. to cut their coats according to their cloth. So no, spend the money no, you've got. Still got All right, John, stuff. thank you very much indeed. John Cordwell there. His book is called Buy, Love, Pain and Money, The Making of a Billionaire by John Cordwell.